Now, let's get started with a review of embryogenesis. There are a number of critical fetal landmarks to be aware of. On day zero, sperm fertilizes egg, forming a zygote and beginning embryogenesis. During week one, the zygote implants as a blastocyst. During week two, the bilaminar disc forms as an epiblast and hypoblast. In week three, gastrulation occurs as well as formation of the primitive streak, notochord, and neural plate. In weeks three through eight, organogenesis occurs and the neural tube is formed. The fetus is extremely vulnerable to teratogens during this period. In week four, the heart starts beating and limb buds form. In week eight, the fetus begins to resemble a baby and fetal movement is present. And in week 10, male or female expression of genitalia is evident. There are a few key points to remember with regard to early development. You want to keep in mind that during the second week it is the rule of twos, referring to two germ layers, the epiblast and hypoblast, that make up the bilaminar disc. In the third week is the rule of threes. There are three germ layers of the gastrula that are formed. These three layers are the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. And in the fourth week it's the rule of fours. Four limb buds and four heart chambers are present. The three embryologic tissues of origin are the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The ectoderm is comprised of the surface ectoderm, which gives rise to the adenohypophysis and forms the epidermis and epithelial linings of the skin, ear, nose, and eye. It also is comprised of neuroectoderm, which gives rise to the neurohypophysis and forms the CNS neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, ependymal cells, and pineal gland. Third is the neural crest that gives rise to the formation of the autonomic nervous system, the dorsal root ganglia, celiac ganglion, Schwann cells, pia and arachnoid, melanocytes, chromaffin cells of the adrenal medulla, and enterochromaffin cells. The mesoderm gives rise to the formation of connective tissue, dura mater, bone, muscle, cardiovascular components, blood, urogenital structures, including kidneys, spleen, and the adrenal cortex. The endoderm gives rise to the formation of gut epithelium and its derivatives such as thyroid follicular cells, the parathyroid and thymus, and the lungs, liver, and pancreas. While on the topic of embryos, we must mention the phenomenon of twinning. There are two types of twinning, monozygotic and dizygotic. Monozygotic twins can develop in two ways. First, one zygote divides evenly and forms two separate amniotic sacs, two chorions, and two placentas. And second, one zygote divides evenly to form two separate amniotic sacs with a single chorion and placenta. Dizygotic or fraternal twins result from two separate zygotes that develop their own individual amniotic sacs chorions, and placentas. Irrespective of the number of embryos, the placenta serves as the primary site of nutrient and gas transfer between the mother and fetus. The maternal component is made up of the decidual basalis, 
which is derived from the endometrium. The fetal component is composed of two layers, the inner cytotrophoblast cells, which develop into chorionic villi, and the syncytiotrophoblast, which secretes HCG. Umbilical cord circulation consists of two umbilical arteries that return deoxygenated blood back to the mother via the placenta, one umbilical vein that provides oxygenated blood to the fetus from the mother via the placenta, and the uricus, which carries urinary waste from the fetal bladder back to the mother via the placenta. The following embryonic structures give rise to specific components of the heart and great vessels. The truncus arteriosus gives rise to the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. The right horn of the sinus venosus gives rise to the smooth portions of both atria. The primitive atria gives rise to the trabeculated portions of both atria the bulbous cordis gives rise to the smooth portions of both ventricles, while the primitive ventricle gives rise to the trabeculated portions of both ventricles. The left horn of the sinus venosus gives rise to the coronary sinus, and the right common and right anterior cardinal veins give rise to the superior vena cava. Development of the interventricular septum takes place in three steps. In step one, the muscular ventricular septum forms, leaving an opening between the left and right called the interventricular foramen. In step two, the aorticopulmonary septum forms to divide the truncus arteriosus into the aortic and pulmonary trunks. In step 3, the muscular ventricular and aorticopulmonary septa join to form the membranous interventricular septum, which closes the interventricular foramen. In contrast, the development of the interatrial septum takes place in six steps. Step 1, the septum primum extends toward the endocardial cushions, narrowing the foramen primum. In step two, the septum primum further develops, leaving only perforations, forming the foramen secundum. In step three, the septum secundum begins to develop, while the foramen secundum maintains the left to right shunt. In step 4, the septum secundum forms a permanent opening called the foramen ovale. Step 5, the foramen secundum enlarges as the upper portion of the septum primum degenerates. And in step 6, the remaining lower portion of the septum primum forms the valve of the foramen ovale. Now let's turn our attention to fetal erythropoiesis. Fetal erythropoiesis takes place in four locations depending on the stage of development. Erythropoiesis takes place in the yolk sac at 3 to 8 weeks, in the liver from 6 to 30 weeks, in the spleen from 9 to 28 weeks, and in the bone marrow from 28 weeks on. You can remember this with the mnemonic Young Liver Synthesizes Blood, which stands for yolk sac, liver, spleen, and bone marrow.